Good day everyone and welcome to this Arcanist guide for the new class for PvP. This is the first new class we've had in a while and honestly it's quite refreshing. So I have also been very happy to try it out the past few days, seeing what works best in it. And this is going to be the video that is the result of that. I have some first impressions, I have builds, I have guides on which skills are good, which are bad in the class. And to showcase all that I have gameplay that also explains what I mean. I've heard a lot of feedback of this class saying it's very bad in PvP, but to be honest I disagree with that and I would rather say it is exceedingly mediocre. It's got some strong points, it's got some weak points, but overall it is very playable and nothing like the time Magden was bad or Mastrock was bad a couple of patches ago. It's especially because right now we are all on a learning curve, trying to get used to the class and what builds work best there, that many people haven't really found the best thing yet to run on it. I think that I have found the best that works for me with the builds that I'm presenting here. They are solid, I have played with it in the PvP the past few days and I can't really imagine much changing about them. But it's always possible that there's some details, some skills that might turn out to be better than what I originally thought. Same counts for some set combos and such, but that's all to be explored in the coming patch. If there is something interesting, I'll be sure to let you know in a pinned comment in this video as well. So, I will start with a little bit of an overview of the class in terms of its strengths and weaknesses. Starting with the strengths, I think the main benefit of this class is the survivability it has. It has an excellent burst heal, it also has an excellent shield that also gives a burst heal on top of that, and it has an excellent life-saving skill that, when under 50% health, also acts as a burst heal. So you could say it even has three burst heals. On top of that, it also has some other really good support skills, and together with the excellent heal over time that Vigor is, you have a really strong survivability toolkit when it comes to the incoming healing that you can have. Next to the survivability, what is also really good is the sound and visual design. I know this video is about gameplay and builds and such, but I do have to mention it that the skills are very satisfying to use. I also find it a very satisfying class to play, simply because of that sound and visual design that they've given it. I think it's definitely a step up from some of the previous classes as well, where this class feels really unique. The sounds, they, they, they sound nice, especially with headphones, I think. And it also has a real nice feel while playing it. That's subjective, of course, but I do want to mention it. Then another benefit is that this class is easy to play. And I say that mostly for the survivability, and that is also the first thing that matters when it comes to making something easy to play, because this class has a straightforward setup with several burst heals you can choose from. It works the best with stacking max health, I will talk more about that later, but stacking max health is also very useful just for survivability. It gives you a lot of leeway for mistakes that you can make, and in that sense it's a very easy to play class that is definitely worth picking up if you're more of a beginner at PvP as well, just like when you're more advanced at it. And then a last quote-unquote strength is the damage stats on paper. So I'm talking in theory right here because the class has some really good debuffs. For example, it has minor brittle and minor vulnerability in what I think is a pretty good stun. It also has a lot of passives that give you a lot of extra damage. The crux system gives you either a lot of continuous extra damage or a lot of burst. So on paper, this class also has really good damage. In practice, it's a bit more difficult to get that damage out there in practice, but I hope that with the builds I will present, I did manage to do that somewhat decently. And that then neatly brings me to the weaknesses of this class. And then firstly, talking about the damage, there is a lack of a burst ability. So the Arcanist has two options for burst ability, it has the beam and it has the tentacle, but both of them have some serious problems to play with. Firstly, there's a beam. This one has two problems. The first is that it can be difficult to hit, you have to aim it. This can be avoided somewhat by using a stun beforehand like Dawnbreaker or Rune of the Colorless Pool, but even then, if people break free fast and if they roll dodge, it is sometimes difficult to keep up with that beam. While on that note though, I do have to mention that ESO also has an accessibility option for that beam. It's located in accessibility under the settings where you have mouse aim assist intensity and gamepad aim assist intensity. These two settings supposedly help with hitting the beam on players. I've tried and play around with these things and I didn't really notice the effect myself, but I do want to mention that in case that for you these things are not at 100 yet where they actually apply. The second problem with the beam is that even after the delay it has where you have the cost animation for it, it's still not yet instant damage. It's a beam. It's a gradual damage over time effect. So you really have to build damage very high and you have to set it up properly because this beam definitely does not work in every situation. 
even if you do cast that beam, it all together with the cast time and the channel takes about one second to start hitting, and then it's not all the damage at once still. Burst abilities need to be able to hit instantly after a stun or an ultimate, but with beam that is not the case, there's always a little bit of a delay, and that can be considered a drawback. Altogether, I do think that the beam is not horrible damage, like on paper it's really high damage. It's also undodgeable, which is super nice, but still it does behave worse than analogs such as Deep Fissure on Warden or Blast Bones on Necromancer. In conclusion, you can have value out of it, but it has some issues in practice. The second burst ability is Tentacular Dread, which deals an AoE frost damage cone in front of you that will deal more damage when you consume Crux, just like the beam. This skill also has two problems in my opinion. Firstly, it deals low damage, because the base damage is super low for a burst ability, and even if you manage to get the full stacks of extra damage from the Crux, you are still not dealing much damage, especially when you compare it again to the analogs of Warden and Necromancer with Deep Fissure or Blast Bones. And then the second problem it has is that it's clunky to use, even more so than the beam in my opinion. And the first reason that is that it has a cast time of 0.3 seconds, I'm not sure why that is, but for a burst ability this is not ideal, and it also behaves completely different from many of your other skills because you always have to wait a bit when you want to animation cancel it. So especially when it comes to high level play as well, this is quite a clunky skill to use on top of not having that much damage. You can build for it to have a lot of damage, but then we are still talking about a 15k tooltip tentacular dread when a deep fissure or a blast bone would have 20k or 25k even. On top of that, tentacular dread also has a bit of a wonky telegraph where sometimes you will miss enemies without really knowing why because the fissure was over it. So it does take some getting used to using this skill on top of the cast time that it has. So that's a big weakness I wanted to talk about, because I think that's the main one this class has. But there are other things as well. For starters, there's the sustain, both in terms of healing and damage skills. This class eats your magicka or your stamina, depending on what you build for. It has some insanely costly skills. Just to give you a quick example, uh, the Spamble Escalating Rune Blades that is in the class has a cost of almost 2.7k Magicka, which is pretty insane for a Spamble. If you compare it to something else, for example Crushing Shock, we are talking about a 2.3k, 2.4k, or for example the Psychic Quarter Spamble, we are talking about a 2.3k cost for your Spamble while this thing costs significantly more magicka. And of course, this one thing is not that much, because here we're talking about a 400-ish difference in cost, but when you pair it with the cost of the other skills as well, both defensively and offensively, you have a class that eats your sustain. Now, that is a drawback, but it is not too bad. This can still be avoided, because sustain is not too difficult to build at all in ESO right now. It counts for both CP and no CP campaigns and battlegrounds, and you can switch things around pretty easily to get good sustain. So I think this makes this class a bit peculiar to build for, since you always have to keep that sustain in mind as well, while in other classes you go more with just pure damage pushing and some resistance pushing, and basically just leaving the sustain to your food and sometimes an HMR. Members. As a side note though, I do want to mention that I don't really think this is a bad thing that this class struggles with sustain a bit because it's been a long time since sustain was an issue at all. Because in many classes, as I mentioned, you just clearly push damage and it does take a part out of theory crafting. That can also be very interesting, also a part out of gameplay where you don't just have to think about your damage and resistances, but you also have to think a little bit about sustain. You have to manage that through your builds and through the use of heavy attacks. But I would say these two things are the main weaknesses of the class. I can imagine with the survivability that is given to this class, if you have a really proper burst damage ability as well, you would have a very powerful thing, similar to Necromancer and Warden when it was just released. But it doesn't, so the class is pretty mediocre right now. Alright, before this section of the builds, I want to add a quick editor note. The builds I have usually got Impervious Rune Ward on the front bar and Rune God of Freedom on the back bar, but that's not the most optimal setup. It's better to have it the other way around, with Impervious Rune Ward on the back bar, where Reconstructed Domain is slotted, and Rune God of Freedom on the front bar for an easier defense and bigger shield from Rune Ward. If anything is unclear, my website has everything updated. And with that out of the way, on with the builds. Then next up I have the builds I have for this patch. Maybe some people have already skipped to this section, and in this case, welcome to the video. Here is three Arcanist builds that I will present, that I have run and that I like running. Two of which that I run a lot, and one of which that I run a bit less, but I do want to mention as well as a viable option. 
So for the first build, I have a quote unquote classic build where I'm going to play this class a bit similar to some other classes where I make use of the class skills for burst healing, healing over time, spam bulls and burst damage abilities. And while I think this build works pretty well and is definitely a good idea if you want to have the most unique feel of a build in this class, it is also plagued by some of the issues that the class in general experiences, such as a damage problem with not having a proper burst ability. The gear of this build is as a back bar 5 pieces of Rallying Cry, a front bar 5 pieces of Or the Swath. The monster set is 2 pieces of Balorg, and then as a mythic I have Death Dealer's Feet with the trainee chest column chain. This is, as I mentioned, a classic build that can be run on other classes as well, that mostly focuses on the use of the own toolkit of the Arcanist, but does still function well. Firstly, I have to mention the front bar set here, all this rough. This is an optional set. It's a placeholder for different things that can go here. Firstly, I have to mention the deadly set that is going to buff your beam by quite a lot. So if you use that in your build and you want to really focus on that particular ability, deadly is also a good option. And then secondly, there is mechanical acuity, where similar to, for example, a Templar, you're going to use that set to proc it on the front bar and then deal huge damage with the ultimate and with the burst ability, the beam. You can notice though that most of the time I'm building into crit chance and crit damage here and all the swath is the perfect example of this because this class has a lot of benefits to that. It has an unnamed 12% crit damage buff which is pretty huge and this means that on paper you can get really high bursts with critical damage and if you use a skill like Dawnbreaker you also can get that burst executed in practice where you follow up that Dawnbreaker with Pragmatic Fate Carver. Then I will mention the back bar set here, Rallying Cry. You can run all the defensive back bar sets here if you want as well. For example, there is Daedric Trickery, which is going to give a lot of buffs that this class doesn't have yet either. It doesn't have any source of major protection, major bending, major vitality. It does have major expedition if you run a race against time or something, but it also doesn't have major heroism. So Daedric Trickery is also going to give you a lot of valuable buffs here, and you can choose to run either this, or you can run Rallying Cry for a mix of both critical resistance, very valuable to counter enemy bursts, and extra damage for you to make use of. Then the monster set is Balorg. Balorg is a really good burst monster set and as I've mentioned several times already this class does have some struggle with burst and that's also why I like using it because if you use this with your Dawnbreaker the Dawnbreaker is going to get really hard. If it quits it's going to be an entire burst in its own right and then if the enemy is not that fast in reacting you can also follow it up pretty reliably with Pragmatic Fate Carver which is also going to benefit a lot from the extra spell damage and the extra penetration from Balorg. Then the mythic, I have Death Dealer's Feet. I think this is the best mythic for the Arcanist and I will always be using that on any Arcanist build, at least in those I have in this video, because it works hand in hand with the Arcanist toolkit. For starters, there is the max health that it gives, which is very valuable if you use the healing skills at scale of max health that I will always be using as well. So that is Impervious Rune Ward and Rune God of Freedom. Both of those only scale off of max health and that is going to be something that Death Dealer's Feet buffs. Then you have the Maxima Magica from Death Deal's Feet, which is also very valuable because I've chosen to have all my class abilities scale off of Magica. So I have a higher Magica pool than a Stamina pool. This class struggles so much with Sustain that I would rather dedicate an entire new pool to those abilities rather than the same pool that I use for important combat abilities such as Breaking Free and Roll Dodges that I definitely don't want to pressure too much. The extra magicka from Death Dealer's Feet is going to help sustain all that because if you have a low amount of magicka, you risk having an issue where you cast or spam five or six different skills in the row and you're suddenly out of magicka. Death Dealer's Feet is not completely going to solve that, but it's going to help solve that because if you have a higher maximum magicka pool, you can cast a few more abilities before completely running out of magicka. Generally speaking, of course, you don't want to do that. You want to have a good combination of abilities, heavy attacks, difference between magicka and stamina abilities to make sure you sustain it on point. But in situations where you do have to use a lot of magicka abilities, this is going to help you do that. Now for the enchants and the traits, I'm going to start with the enchants. Generally speaking, I've gone with full triglyphs on the enchants, which is the most stat dense glyph and definitely what you want if you want a healthy amount of both a lot of max health, some good magicka and some good stamina. If you don't have the gold for this, you can actually also go with just pure health enchants. Especially on the smaller pieces, if you want to do that, it's perfectly viable. Especially if you're running Death Deal's Feet on top of that, because it's going to give you a good amount of stamina and magicka either way. So I do want to mention that on the side. 
Then for this build in the Jewelry Enchants, I have two Weapon and Spell Damage Enchants with Magical Recovery, so that's the Magical Harm Glyph, and one Reduced Magical Cost. That can also be a Magical Harm Glyph if you want to push damage. So the reason I've gone with two damage and one sustain glyph is simply because, as I've mentioned, sustain on this class is tough. So to be completely comfortable, I do like running that. The weapon traits, I have sharpened and non-honed on the dual wield. No matter what set I run here, be it deadly, older scarf, or mechanical and cutie. Then on the back bar, I have defending. Pretty basic, gives you extra defense. Infused is also a good option. I'm a bit on the fence here, which I like the most, and I might switch later on and such as well, because Infused is going to give you a permanent buff of 500 spell damage if you regularly swap between front bar and back bar, and I like to use that on classes that have plenty of survivability already, which includes this one. So Defending and Infused are both good options with the Berserk Weapon Damage Enchantment. And then about the enchantments, on the front bar, I don't have enchantments. I have the Damage Health Poison with the double dot to it, this is just going to give a lot of extra pressure, which is useful to have on top of your other abilities. And I find it more valuable than enchants. The traits on the jewelry are full bloodthirsty. Bloodthirsty is also a trait I'm always going to use on the Arcanist. And the reason for that is the same as why I pushed Max Health. I don't really care about my spell damage as much for healing. So my shield, Impervious Rune Ward and Rune Guard of Freedom, would not be improved by running an infused spell damage enchantment. But your damage skills do get boosted a lot by Bloodthirsty, more so in fact than by Infused. So if you want to maximize damage, Bloodthirsty is the way to go. On top of that, this class doesn't have a proper execute. So in order to alleviate for that and not being forced in running a specific execute from a weapon skill or somewhere else, or from running Cephaliarch's Flail for the execute, that is a bit shitty as well. So every skill I cast becomes a bit of an execute. And that's how I built that mechanic in this class anyway. The traits on the armor, I've gone with mostly impenetrable and divine, so you can also go with well fitted. Usually a mix of all three of those is good to go. They all have their value. Impenetrable, of course, is going to make it hard to burst you. Even if you have rallying cry, this is still valuable because there are some light blades, for example, out there who have a seriously high amount of crit damage. Divines is going to increase your own damage if you run the Shadow Mundus or your own sustain if you run the Aetronach Mundus. So if you like one of those, I suggest going with that trait. And in Well Fitted is going to boost your Stamina Sustain. Generally speaking, this build is very fine already when it comes to Stamina Sustain, but it never hurts to be able to just squeeze out another 2 or 3 roll dodges because that's great for both mobility and defense, no matter if you are in a group play or in outnumbered play 1vx. On the chest, as always, Reinforced is the best trait. Then for the skills on this build, so first skill is Pragmatic Fate Carver, that is my burst ability. I'll make sure to always have three crux up when I cast it and to apply the stun, Rune of Calder's Pool to the enemy or Dawnbreaker if I follow it up with Pragmatic Fate Carver. Then Escalating Rune Blades is the spam ball. I've chosen this morph over Rising Rune Blades because I like the extra AoE portion in it. It goes nicely with the AoE from Pragmatic Fate Carver and Dawnbreaker. Plus the extra tooltip damage is more useful than having extra crit on the skill and having crux up. Because the crux I generate in this build I'm constantly using up with both Pragmatic Fate Carver and Impervious Rune Ward. Then I have Vigor. This is a sort of a flex spot, one of the two flex spots in fact, where I will either run Resolving Vigor or Evolving Runement. Evolving Runement would be on paper the most amount of healing because it's really strong burst heal and a heal over time, but I don't really like how much magic it costs. It gives me some serious problems sustaining. So instead of that, I've gone with Vigor, which gives a perfectly fine amount of healing as well, and it costs stamina. So I can use my stamina pool, which is not used that much on this build, to carry my healing a lot with just Vigor and Roll Dodge on top of that, as always. Then the fourth skill is Impervious Rune Ward. This is basically my main burst heal. I make sure to always cast it with Crux, except when I'm in a really tough spot, and then sometimes I will cast this and then Vigor right after if I'm, for example, on 20% health and somebody is about to start casting Radiant Oppression on me. I need that shield as soon as possible then, and sometimes then I will cast it even if I don't have any Crux active. Generally speaking though, you want to keep this skill for when you have Crux active because it's going to give you a huge shield and a huge burst heal 2 in 1. Then the stun, I've already talked about that earlier, but basically a good stun to have to combo with your Dawnbreaker and Pragmatic Fate Carver. Then for the back bar, as my first ability here, I have my Flex Spot again, which is Race Against Time. It can be any mobility ability you like. So Race Against Time fits. It's going to give you extra crit damage, very useful for this build, which focuses on crit damage anyway. 
And it can also be Mist Form, which is going to be a sort of portal skill, which also gives good mobility. And it can be the portal from the Arcanist, Fleet Footed Portal. If you really want to run for some reason, that's where I would put it. Then the second skill is Reconstructive Domain. This skill is going to give you a lot of buffs, a lot of damage, and heal over time. It's going to allow you to hold your ground better. And this build also has a lot of healing as such, so it plays a bit more than a brawl than the other builds. And this skill goes hand in hand with that to boost your damage and your sustain. Then Elemental Drain. The options here are Elemental Drain and Elemental Susceptibility. Both morphs are good, but generally speaking, I've chosen to go with Elemental Drain for many builds, including this one, because I lack Magical Sustain on the Arcanist. So this is exactly a way you can solve that by applying Minor Magical Steel on the enemy. Plus, the status effects from Elemental Susceptibility are not that useful. After all, I already have Minor Vulnerability from my stun regardless, so I'm not really getting the benefit from having that apply from elemental susceptibility as well. Then Rune God of Freedom. This is the skill that is an absolute lifesaver, sort of a second burst heal as well in case that you are below 50% health and you don't have enough magical sustain to cast Impervious Rune Ward. But more importantly, Rune God of Freedom allows me to just pressure an enemy pretty freely and not having to worry that much about a sudden combination of ults from multiple enemies and definitely something I want to run in this build too. Then the armor buff, pretty basic, gives you armor, gives you a little bit more damage as well. On the back bar, right now, I've stopped the Tight King's Gaze. This is nice to open up with as well. Again, it's important to combo that. So you can do Tight King's Gaze from your back bar. Then you switch to your front bar with Rune of the Coldest Poo. So then your enemy will be standing still, either blocking or stunned. Will get hit by the Tight King's Gaze. And you can follow it up with Pragmatic Fate Carver. And that way you can have a nice burst in your toolkit. If you like using this skill a lot, you can also place it on the front bar with then Precognition on the back bar. But generally speaking, I have chosen to put Tyskin's Gaze on the back bar and Dawnbreaker on the front bar because that is going to allow me to quickly cast Dawnbreaker from the front bar. And I like that a lot in order to create breathing room for myself to quietly go and burst an enemy while not getting hit myself too much. As Dawnbreaker is an AoE CC, that will this way also reduce a lot of the incoming pressure on you while dealing out a huge burst. Then for the champion points on this build, on the blue tree I have Tormaturge. This is a flex spot champion point. You can also slot Wrathful Strikes here, depending on whether you want to purely focus on having a high quote-unquote burst with Pragmatic Fade Carver, or whether you want to buff the damage of your entire toolkit. Then you have Focus Mending. It's a staple on any build. 10% healing is really strong. Then Biting Aura. This is going to buff my Pragmatic Fate Cover and my Dawnbreaker, so it's a valuable CP. And then Fighting Finesse. This is a crit build, so I do like to have that 8% extra crit damage and critical healing done. Then for the Red Tree, I have Sustained by Suffering, Pain's Refuge, Survival Instincts, and Celerity. Celerity is a flex spot. I like the mobility a lot for 1vx. To be able to kite around super fast is very valuable. But you can also slot it for CPs that give you more tankiness, such as... Relentlessness or the armor CP fortified. And then lastly for all the auxiliary stuff, so as a race here I have a high elf. This is a pretty good race for an arcanist simply because it's going to give you a bunch of extra damage and this has a little passive where it's going to give you 5% damage reduction while casting Pragmatic Fate Carver which also goes nicely with that shield that gives interrupt immunity on it. But it is arguable whether this is the best option or not. People have also gone Breton. Since this class struggles a lot with sustain, it can be very beneficial to have the strong sustain passive that Breton has and then being able to further push your damage with jewelry and such without having to invest anything in sustain. So Breton is 100% also worth considering. Then there is also Imperial for the same reason and Dark Elf for roleplay reasons or if you just like having a lot of stamina together with some good damage passives and damage reduction from DKs. My attribute points are all into max health. Max health is important on this class. I will always have 64 points into health because my healing scales with it and I don't care about maximum magicka and maximum stamina that much. And the food, which right now is not equipped, is Ozorka Smoke Bear Haunch. This is going to give me max health, super important, but also magic regeneration, super important, and stamina regeneration. Stamina regeneration is a bit arguable on whether you want this. I like it because it's going to give me so much flexibility in the amount of roll dodges, break freeze, and vigor casts I can do. But if you think this is a bit overkill for your build, you can also go with Clockwork Citrus Filet, which is going to give you health, maximum magic, and magic recovery, as well as some health recovery. And basically what this does is you're going to trade a stamina recovery and a little bit of health and magic recovery for more maximum magicka. So essentially that is more magicka sustain if you want it. 
for the mendes here i've come with asian arc to help my sustain as this is a crit build it's also valuable to go with uh, shadow mendes for example especially if you're a breton so these are two good options to have and then vampire stage 3 as always and ever you want that too then for the second build i have a ranged proc build this is going to be closely related to the melee proc build but i'll use the third melee proc build more than the second ranged proc build I do want to mention this range prop build though because it has a lot of ranged pressure and it has a very valuable spot in its own right. So for the gear options, this is going to be running the Drogan set on the front bar, Vatashkin's perfected eye staff on the back bar, and then double bard, perfected relegan, ideal but non-perfected is also good, then one piece trainee and death deals feet. Essentially what this is going to do is you're going to apply a lot of pressure from range to Drogakin and Relican. These are two really good proc sets. And it's going to give you a lot of little the instances of damage that will get buffed by Drogakin, as well as the little instances of damage you will get from your skills that also gets buffed by Drogakin. This way, you have a lot of range pressure, and you try and make up for the lack of damage that the Arcanist can have. Defensively, this build is still valid as well, as you keep on building max health and a decent amount of magic sustain, and that way you can cast your heals, which are pretty strong, pretty frequently. As for the traits, enchants and such, it's very similar to the first build, where I just have Tristat enchants, Bloodthirsty trait on the jewelry, weapon damage enchants. In this case, I don't have a reduced cost enchant because I have a little bit of extra sustain from Drogakin and I can heavy attack pretty safely. On the front bar, I have a charged staff with the poison again. Charles can also proc the satisfaction from the poison damage that this poison is going to deal to the enemy, so it's not necessary to have the poison enchant on it. But either the poison enchant with a high chance to proc the sets effect, or the poison, actual poison, which is going to deal a dot and have a lower chance to proc the sets effect, are very valid here. Back bar, I have a defending ice staff with the weapon damage enchantment on it. Again, this can be infused too if you want it. Then for the skills, on the front bar, I have camouflaged hunter, escalating rune blades, resolving vigor, impervious rune ward, rune of the coldest pool, and dawnbreaker. Two quick notes for starters, the Escalating Runeblades here, I still have this from the previous build, but I do prefer to go with Rising Runeblades here because I don't use my Crux as much because I don't use Pragmatic Fate Carver or Tentacular Dread. The only skill really that uses Crux here is Impervious Rune Ward that I'm going to use as a very good burst heal, but next to that I will have three Crux active pretty frequently, and then I can use the extra crit from Rising Runeblades as this is going to increase my damage pretty nicely as this class has good damage modifiers for crit damage. Then on my back bar I have Rallying Cry, Inspired Scholarship, Elemental Drain, Rune God of Freedom and Crux Weaver Armor with the ultimate The Titan King's Gaze. Elemental Drain is where I have the second note to make here. I prefer Elemental Susceptibility because Elemental Susceptibility is going to give me a lot of extra damage instances. And since I have charged on the front bar already, I'm going to have a decently good uptime on minor Magicka Steel regardless from the magic damage from Inspired Scholarship and Escalating Rune Blades. Rune of the Colorless Pool already provides minor vulnerability, so that's not really gained from running Elemental Susceptibility, but it still has the little damage proc from the status effect from shock damage, on top of, of course, the fire damage, the poison damage, the frost damage, etc., from your abilities and enchants. So I do prefer Elemental Susceptibility for more procs that will also be buffed by Drogakin. Inspired Scholarship here is going to take the place of Reconstructive Domain. The reason I did that is because, first of all, this is going to be an additional damage instance, and it's going to get buffed nicely by Drogakin. The more damage instances, the better. Secondly, I'm a bit more mobile on this build. This is a range build, so I'm not really tied to sticking on an area to damage my enemies. I can dance around them, and then I will also often run out of the AoE of Reconstructive Domain, and that's why I prefer to have Inspired Scholarship. And then third, I'm also going to have Major Brutality and Major Sorcery. That, in combination with Camouflage Hunter, allows me to run Tricep Potions instead of Spell Power Potions, just give me a lot of extra Stamina Sustain. And that extra Stamina Sustain from the Tripods, I can then use to switch from Azorka Smoke Bearhorn to Clockwork Cypress Fillet, thus boosting my Magical Sustain further. One more thing I have to mention, that here Escalating Rune Blades is a skill that I use on a range build as well, this is maybe better done by Crushing Shock. Crushing Shock is also going to give you multiple damage instances and is going to proc all the stats effects, which is very valuable on builds with Trogakin. But just for this case, I have chosen to run Escalating Rune Blades because it's new, because it's fancy, and because I want to. And it's also okay as it deals three damage instances. Then for the champion points on this build, 
I have Deadly Aim, Focus Mending, Tomaturge, and Dualistic Buff. Tomaturge is going to nicely buff the damage of Relican and the Dodge Shield Private Stats effects and poisons and such, but it can also be filled by Wrathful Strikes. And then for the recipe, as before, I have Sustained by Suffering, Pain's Refuge, Survival Instincts, and Celerity. Then lastly for the third build, this is also a build I like to run a lot on the Arcanist and that you'll probably see more of on this channel as the patch progresses. This build is a front bar Masters Perfected Dual Wield, on the back bar Vartashran's Perfected Eye Staff. Then on the five piece I have Dragon's Appetite, as a monster set I have Zan and then two pieces of Trainee with Death Deal's Feet. So just to give some explanation here, this build is a pure prog build. It is going to completely use procs to replace your damage. Well, more like adding your damage on what the class can already provide. And it's just going to heavily carry the lack of damage that the class has, while also still providing good survivability due to Dragon's Appetite and the natural survivability of the class skills. As always, I'll be building max health here, so I get the same amount of healing from my burst heals. And overall, the spell damage is not going to be that bad either when it's fully buffed, somewhere between 5 and 6k. In total, this build is going to use four different proc sets. So you have Dragon's Appetite, which is going to increase the damage of all the little damage instances you do through stats effects and proc sets. Master Deal Weed is going to be really nice to buff the dot from Sting Slashes, and is also going to serve as a spammable. Potashkin's Perfected Eye Staff is going to give you a nice little dot proc set, and then Zan is going to be an extremely strong beam ability on the enemy as well, and it's important to stay in range with them, use Rune of the Coldest Pool with them to make sure that they don't get out of range or break it otherwise, so you can also stick onto them. And then all that damage is going to culminate into an extremely huge burst if you manage to get Zan taken on them for a long time. Dragon's Appetite, as I mentioned, is going to buff the damage from all that proc sets and all your skills, but it's also going to give you more healing. So this is a melee build, but has a little less crit healing, a little less survivability as you're not running Rallying Cry, and thus having the extra heal from Dragon's Appetite is super useful to stay in the fight for longer. Dragon's Appetite is also going to give you some weapon damage, valuable, and two lines of stamina recovery, which goes hand in hand with the fact that here I'm running an additional stamina skill, rending slashes, to be used with Master's Perfected Dual Wield. I've gone with Maces here instead of Axes. Axes would also work, I think, but generally speaking, this build is purely all little instances, and there it is also nice to have crits, but it's not as valuable as having a crit on a huge burst ability like other classes can have it with Blast Bones or Deep Fissure. So here I do prefer Maces, while the other melee build that relies more on Burst from the Dawnbreaker and the Pragmatic Fate Carver benefits a little bit more from the Axis in my opinion. As in Chance here I have Poison Damage and Disease Damage. These offer two status effects that the build doesn't have yet. On top of that you get a status effect of Fire Damage, Shock Damage and Frost Damage from the Vartashkun's Perfected Eye Staff and Elemental Susceptibility. And then you get the Bleed stats effect, Hammerhage, from the Twin Slashes, which is going to deal Bleed damage. So overall, you get a lot of stats effects in this build, a lot of pressure this way, on top of your proc sets, and that's basically how this build functions. You can also, if you want to, replace the 2-piece Trainee and Death Deal's feet, as well as the Zahn's monster set, by Serpent's Disdain. But that's more of an option if you don't have one of these sets like Zahn, Death Deal's feet, and such. I want to mention it, but generally speaking, I do think it's better to have the Mythic and the Monster set. One more thing about the gear, ideally it's all Bloodthirsty here as well. I've gotten one infused to Bloodthirsty. It's also all Spell Damage Enchant, and the two pieces of the Trainee can also be one piece of Trainee and one piece of Druid's Braid. It depends a bit on whether you want to stack some more Magicka for your Magicka Sustain or more Health for your general survivability with bigger shields and bigger heals. Then for the skills in this build, I have Escalating Rune Blades, Pending Slashes, Resolving Vigor, Impervious Rune Ward, Rune of the Coldless Pool, and Tide King's Gaze. And then on the back bar, I have Race Against Time, Reconstructive Domain, Elemental Drain, Rune God of Freedom, Crux Weaver Armor, and Precognition. I have to talk a little bit about the morphs, because some of these morphs are still from the previous builds. So for starters, Elemental Drain should be Elemental Susceptibility for more procs of status effects, and that will grow greatly with the dot and status effect build that this is. Then for the front bar here, Escalating Rune Blades. Here, again, you have a choice. You can run either, but I've also gone with Rising Rune Blades a lot because the only skill that uses the Crux here is Impervious Rune Ward. So I have a lot of Crux active pretty frequently, which Escalating Rune Blades is going to benefit from with extra crit. Now for the ultimate, I have the Tide Skin Gaze. As before, you can choose a bit on whether you want this ultimate, the Tide Skin's Gaze, or maybe Dawnbreaker for a nice AoE CC. 
On this builder could also be valuable to have inspired scholarship to slot here instead of reconstructive domain. But as this is a melee build with pretty good survivability, I do like to have reconstructive domain here, which is also going to give me some extra damage on top of extra sustain and an extra heal, which is easy to stay inside of as this build brawls easier than the previous ranged proc build. Then for the champion points, I have Duelist rebuff, Focus Mending, Deadly Aim and Fighting Finesse. And then for the Red Tree, Sustained by Suffering, Pain's Refuge, Survival Instincts and Celerity. In the blue tree about Duelist rebuff, you can if you want to also slot Ironclad. But Ironclad is a somewhat, just a little bit less effective here compared to other classes as the Arcanist gets minor evasion. And this is already going to reduce the damage from direct AoE attacks, while the damage from single target attacks, both direct and damage over time, is having relatively speaking less resistance in the base class toolkit, so the list rebuff becomes a little bit stronger here than in other classes. Fighting Finesse here is a CP that goes well with the crit passives that the Arcanist has, but this is also a flex spot where you can slot Wrathful Strikes instead as another option for a damage CP. And that's it for the builds I have made for the Arcanist that I think work the best in this match. As a conclusion to this guide, I just want to answer a few questions. More particularly, what is the state of this class on release? How can you best quickly tell what it can and can't do compared to the other classes? And is it worth playing? In terms of playstyle, I think it's the most similar to a Templar, where you have a Grand AoE to stand in, where sometimes you have some tough sustain, you have sometimes some trouble switching from defense to offensive. You have a spam build that is gradual, several hits rather than instant. You have some troubles with burst. After all, Templar also had some problems with purifying light. And that's similar to the Arcanist, where its burst ability is also rather mediocre. An obvious other comparison to Templar is with the Execute that it has, the Radiant Oppression, and in the Arcanist you also have a beam being Pragmatic Fate Carver, but those do behave quite differently as Fate Carver is something you have to aim, and of course the Arcanist doesn't have an Execute at all, which is also a bit of a limiting factor, even though I managed to play around that by just using Bloodthirsty Traits. As I mentioned at the start, I heard a lot of people calling this a bad class, sometimes even just a bad Sorcerer, but I don't think this class is like Sork at all. The only comparison here is that this class has a better shield than Hardened Ward. The portal it has for ability is not like Streak at all, and it doesn't offer any ability to get out of a fight unless if you manage to place it luckily across a gap or something. Overall, it's a mid-tier class. I would say B-tier, maybe A-tier in terms of survivability. And this survivability is also the reason it is playable in PvP. The damage is not carrying it anywhere really, and I generally believe that if it would have a lot of damage, with for example a good burst ability, we'd be looking at one of the top tier classes like Necro and Warden when launched. Then for the last question, is it worth playing? I think it's 100% worth playing either way, because it does function, it does work in PvP, because of the strong pass that I mentioned earlier, because it has really good design, both auditive and visual, and it's a new breath of fresh air into the game. It's fun to play, it's well designed, it's playable, so it's 100% going for. And I think with that I will conclude this guide. So as always, I thank you very much for watching. Check out the links in the description for more information and for support, and I hope to see you next time.